Hello, folks. <clears throat> Are we having fun yet? Yeah, some good talks up here. I'm going to start with an idea. I'm going to explain my idea, and I'm going to give you two stories about this to try and support my idea and try to make you buy into it. My idea is pretty simple. I believe that we're all lifelong learners and that we really can't turn it off. We're always learning. You wouldn't be here this late on an afternoon if you weren't trying to learn something. Okay, so we're, this room is filled with lifelong learners. We all have some knowledge, and for some of us, we have lots of knowledge. You've been in, in learning situations your whole life. There comes a time when you act on that knowledge. And uh, I, my saying is do more good, apply your knowledge. I think there's a time when you act on that knowledge and you apply it to your community, to better your community, and I think knowing that time is essential. Knowing when it is that you have that knowledge you can apply. And for somebody to be successful, they have recognized when to apply their knowledge. And that's the, that's the idea that I'm going to try and sell you. The stories, I have two stories to tell you about it. It's a story about a man and a lake. Uh, not just any lake, this lake. And it's not exactly a romance story. But it's, uh, I did fall in love with this lake. Uh, I uh, will tell you a little bit about, if you get nothing else out of this, you'll get a history of Lake Makatawa that you can take home and impress your friends. But we're also going to talk about my history and how I came to be here. Uh, I have a real goal, and my goal is to make Lake Makatawa a little cleaner for my children, and we'll see how that all parses together. First, a little history about myself. I'm a college professor. I've been teaching at Hope College for 18 years, about two blocks that way, and I have uh, uh, studied uh, officially in college for 47 years. I have been associated with an educational institute for 47 years, and I'm not that old. Okay, that means I've never left my ivory castle. I've been sitting in academia, and I'm trying to do research, I'm trying to teach, and I've been doing that for a long time. Uh, my background is in nuclear chemistry. I drive a particle accelerator at work. Two blocks over that way in the basement, there is a particle accelerator, and students are using it to look at Lake Max sediment. That's kind of fun. It's the same technology... <clears throat> I think it's fun. It's the same technology that uh, NASA uses to look at the sediment on Mars. We think it's sediment, where water once was. And it's the same technology that they're trying to identify what the rocks are on Mars. So this is really s rocket science. I'm a rocket scientist. I'm the proverbial rocket, science you si ro rocket scientist you sat next to in class, right? And so I always grew up a geek. I was always interested in learning more. I always did more of that education. And I stayed in school forever as a result. Okay? But I... Uh, as a result of all this knowledge, I was in a cyclotron lab at Michigan State about 20 years ago, and I met a young, wonderful young woman who became my wife, and suddenly we were a dual career couple, and we were looking for two academic jobs, which is hard to do, and we stumbled, uh, stumbled upon this place called West Michigan. And Hope College offered us two positions uh, with some strings attached, and after a while it became obvious that if I wanted a job, well, could you teach environmental science too? Does it get me a job? Yes. I'd loved, I've always wanted to teach environmental science. And so uh, this is how my job became defined as chemistry and environmental science. And I've been doing that. I always stay 15 minutes ahead of the students. I read up on it and then I teach it. And it's one of those, it's one of those lifelong learning experiences that has really been fun for me. And of course, when my wife and I moved to this region, we found Lake Makatawa and we have actually swum in it. We've fished in it. We actually water ski in it quite regularly still a little more slowly. Uh, and this lake has become something that we all drive around. As a community member, most of you know about this lake. You drive over it, you see it in the summer. We don't really think much about the history of it. And in the last 10 years, I've learned a lot about the history of what made Lake Makatawa polluted. Uh, Maca toilet, you may have heard. Okay, yeah, that's what we're trying to get rid of. And as a result, that lesson has, I've come across a couple of real discoveries recently that has had made a great impact on me, and now I'm going to try and make an impact back on that lake, and that's kind of fun. The, uh, is Lake Makatawa polluted? Yeah. We have a demonstration of that here. This is an aerial photograph. You can see Big Red going out the channel. Holland State Park is right here. That's the channel entering Lake Michigan. We are blessed to be on a very large, beautiful lake called Lake Michigan. It's still one of the largest freshwater bodies in the world, and it is very clean. Okay? Lake Makatawa isn't so clean. 
That is dirt, that's sediment that's transporting out into Lake Michigan. And on most days, if you drive across that in your boat, you can see, you can cut it with a knife. It's the, got the very clear sediment on one side and clear blue water on the other. And that's our Lake Makatawa. Um, how did it get that way? Well, we have too much dirt. What that dirt brings with it is a nutrient called phosphates. The phosphates detach and they uh, produce algae blooms. Algae blooms are great for about a week, they turn green, and then they die. And they start to decay. When they decay, they eat dissolved oxygen out of the water, and you get this hypertrophic cycle, which just knocks the eco ecological balance of the lake out of whack. So you get dead fish. You get dead decaying algae and dead fish, and that's a smell. And nobody likes that around tulip time, but it's always there. Okay, so this is the unhealthy cycle of Lake Mac that it got to that state, and it's dirt, right? I'm a rocket scientist, how hard could this be? It's a small lake, it's only about yay big. Uh, you can see the whole thing, and I ought to be able to solve this. Well, <laughs> 15 years later, I'm just beginning to understand the magnitude of the problem. These are very complex natural systems, and they're interwoven with lots of different factors that contribute to this. However, it is possible to understand how we got there. And so from my personal history, I'm now gonna go into the history of the lake, and how these two intersect is kind of interesting. The lake began about 9,000 years ago. In fact, 9,000 years ago, there was no Lake Makatawa. That was a stream running through the middle of some banks of, of, of uh, uh, West Michigan, and it ran halfway to Chicago till it ran into the body of water. There was no Lake Michigan 9,000 years ago. You could walk from here to Chicago and only get your knees wet. Okay, that's because the glaciers had taken away most of the water and the Great Lakes hadn't formed. This river carved its way through for a few thousand years, and then 4,500 years ago, the waters uh, uh, filled up the Great Lakes and made it to its present uh, uh, level. And these waters also brought sand dunes with them. Those wonderful, beautiful West Michigan sand dunes are now covering most of the West Shore banks. And what we have is a, what's officially called a drowned river mouth valley. And all of West Michigan, Michigan is covered with them. The Kalamazoo, the White Lake, all those ones are all drowned river mouth valleys where the water level came and made this. It's not a very deep lake. It's only about 10 feet deep most places. Uh, but it is, uh, it's ours. And uh, when it was blocked, when it was blocked off, the water was trapped behind it. It would only seasonally go into Lake Michigan. Okay, so every spring when you got the rains, it would flood into Lake Michigan. The rest of the days, it was isolated from the rest of the, uh, rest of the, uh, the waters. And the lake itself was always very dark because the area around it, which is what's called a watershed, is this is a map of the area in West Michigan. You have the Lake Mac in the middle and the, all the area in green that encompasses uh, Holland and Zealand, almost up to Hudsonville, is what's called the Lake Mac watershed. Every drop of water that falls in that green box drains through Lake Mac, goes out by Big Red. Every toilet that flushes drains through the Holland Border Public Works treatment plant and back out, or the Zealand, and back out into the waterway. So that water is where we live and, and we are responsible for what has happened to that water. What's interesting to note is that when the settlers first came here 150 years ago, they altered it. They put the channel in for shipping, you need to have trend, uh, commerce. Uh, but then the next thing they discovered was that it was a swamp. Okay, and there were lots of trees. The uh, students have looked in the historical archives to try and find records of what the lake used to look like so we can see what sort of state we'd like to get it back to. And the first thing we discovered is that there were so many trees and, and, and forests in this area. There was a deciduous forest that was a cedar swamp between Holland and Zealand. It, there were records in the, in the archives that say it took a man on a horse a day to get to Zealand. Why was that? because the horse had to go halfway down to Ganges, which we now know as Sorgatuck, and then back up the outside to get around the swamp. The swamp was so th thick with the mud and so thick with trees that a man on a horse could not cross it. The only way to get to Zealand was by boat or you took the long way around the horse. That's remarkable. There's another passage in the archives that shows that you must have two men and a saw to cut down a tree. You could not fell a tree in this 100-foot cedar forest with an ax. Why? Because every time you swung the ax back, you hit a second tree. Those are remarkable images that are written in the words of our, our first settlers that said the trees were so close together and so tall that they couldn't possibly swing an ax between them. That gives you an idea of what the landscape was like before the uh, very industrious in uh, Dutch settlers arrived. And the uh, uh, Dutch settlers had to live, so what they did is they cleared the land. There are now currently zero old growth trees left in this land, in the, within this green area. They cut them all down. 100% of the trees went, okay? The next thing they did is they, were, they understood how to deal with water. They came from the Netherlands. They dug channels and they drained the swamps. 
there was a lot of malaria back in those days. They didn't realize it was waterborne, but they realized that if they wanted to grow crops, they got rid of the water. And so they drained and made this whole ring around the outside at arable land, something you could grow crops on. They didn't do it intentionally to destroy water quality, but an unintentional consequence of that was that every time it rains now, we get topsoil washing off that, the, the open fields, and we get it moving downstream. Okay. That's a very significant problem uh, if you think about the eutrophic state that makes the lake come. But it's very hard to imagine uh, what you do to fix that. What, what we have, <laughs> catch my breath here, I'm on a roll. Uh, <laughs> We have a lake that is, uh, we've changed 150 years ago. How are we going to fix that? Uh, well, I'm going to start with doing some sediment sampling. And so all those little red dots you see up there are some tubes, which is the idea I had scientifically, is to measure how that soil came from. And each of those sediment stations are a set of PVC pipes, which we call a low-cost sediment sampler. And those pipes are set in the field, you may have seen them driving around, and these are some of my students out there collecting them, and what we've done is for the first time just measure the sediment. Where does it come from? And this isn't a very creative idea, but it was different. Nobody had done that quite before. And as a result, we have this map which shows for the first time, it ground truths what the model said as to where the sediment was coming from, and we have measurements from an event back last, last summer. Uh, we've done eight events last year, we're going to do another eight this summer. We're going to take an average to find out where that sediment's coming from, to identify the locations that if I had a dollar to remediate this, where would I best spend that dollar to get the maximum impact? And this is just a basic study that needs to be done, but nobody had ever done that before. And some of the values we're getting are, are, are incredible. 160 grams per single tube is about 80 times what it should be, at least what we read in the records. And so the students get engaged in doing this. We've uh, actually made a measurement for the first time that's beginning to get a lot of traction. There's a group in North Carolina that's going to take the same technology and apply it to the Barrier Islands and the tidal marshes there. And that's fun. There are people listening to a nuclear chemist talk about dirt. <laughs> this is really wild. And so I'm beginning to have an impact by doing my scientific studies and, and actually beginning to apply that knowledge of how do you learn about something. If you're going to fix it, you have to know the history of what caused it to be, uh, to be uh, impaired in the first place. And this is what I've been trying to do. So we have this, and it doesn't stop right there. We also have a uh, sampling going on to address the microbial contamination in Lake Mac. As you may note, Dutton Park has been closed several times. Danger, swimming, do not enter. Those are sort of warnings you get from microbial infections of a lake. Now you're in trouble because a nuclear chemist is going to tell you about microbiology. <laughs> but if you uh, understand what's available, we hired an expert from MSU that came down and spent a summer with us, and we analyzed all the E. coli that we could catch, and there were lots of E. coli. And this is a fecal indicator bacteria that describes that there must be some sort of waste in the water stream. And that's not healthy to be swimming in, so you'd really like to understand where that came from. And we did uh, sophisticated, we not only counted where it was, as you can see in some of these plots, but we also identified what was its carrier. Um, you are what you eat, and the DNA of these critters that live in your intestine reflect that it's either human, cow, pig, or some other sort, sort of, uh, of DNA. So for the first time ever, we've done a DNA source tracking of the microbial infections in Lake Mac. And you want to know something really, this is the reference to something really interesting, is that it is not human, for the most part. It's not cow, it's not pig, and it doesn't match any patterns of avian that we know. It's an entirely new species of critter that's living in our lake. It isn't living in the lake. We think it's living well upstream. You can see from this diagram it's coming from upstream. We think we have an endogenous population of E. coli that's living outside of a mammalian, mammalian intestine. It's been reported before in the literature, but it's never been reported on this scale. We think we have a really massive infestation of a biofilm that this critter is growing. It's a very opportunistic animal. It can live in the air or aerobically, anaerobically, and it's actually living in a biofilm. This is good news for the lake. It's not nearly as dangerous that way as if it's human waste. If it was human waste, we'd be in trouble. Uh, it wouldn't be water skiing. But it is not. And it actually, now that we know what the problem is, all we have to do is identify the sources, and then it's treatable. So there is a conclusion from this. While it's scary, we've got this science fiction thing growing on out there. We've got this new, I have a vision of going out one night and seeing something stare back at me. It's going to be great. <laughs> It's something that, the, and believe me, the rest of the world is listening to this. I've been given two talks in Lansing in the last month simply because they're very interested in what this could possibly be and is this real. 
and nobody knows exactly, we have to prove it still, but it's one of those things that you can get and, and you are beginning to make an impact both on the local and the national. It's been very good for me. I get publications, I get funding, I get people listening to me. But, and it's good for my students. We have a whole bunch of students. This is, this is my watershed moment, if you'll excuse the pun, where I realized what was happening to me. Instead of having one student or two students doing research on the lake as sort of a sideline, it's become a major initiative to combine all my knowledge and all my training to try and apply. I have these students running particles throughout ASU, but they are using it on the sediment in Lake Mac and trying to answer a local question. And we've come up with some discoveries that are really fundamental, which are fun. Um, the, other watershed moment is that you can make a difference. If you apply your knowledge at the right time and you're in the right position to do so, I'm the only one that has this sort of technology living on the lake that makes it wonderful. You can apply it for all the right reasons. These are my students at the top and these are my uh, real reasons for doing Lake Mac on the bottom. My two children who are out helping me. I can't get the college students in the water this time of year. But the, my, <laughs> my, my children will do anything for ice cream, so they're out there in December. Uh, and we are actually going to have a cleaner lake for my children, okay? And that's something that is in my lifetime, and I am going to try and make a difference to the community. And this is the take-home message I'd like all of you to make. I'd love you all to help work on Lake Mac, but I'd also encourage you to find your own lake, okay? It may not be a lake at all, but it may be something to which you have a great deal of wisdom in this room and a great deal of knowledge. If you guys apply your knowledge at the right time with the right resources, yes, you need a little luck, yes, you need a lot of funding, but if you apply yourself at the right time, you too can make a difference to the community. And I'd encourage you to do more good and, uh, uh, to, with your community and improve it. Thanks for your attention.